Alright, welcome one and all, whoever may be watching this. This will be part 27. I think we're up to Planescape. To Planescape. No, that's not the game. Torment, Tides of Numenera. Let's come up here. It took me a second when I was editing the last couple of videos to sort of figure out, oh, this is the labyrinth. So this is the place where Aretas did his thing and now we have to figure that out. So while I'm here, I might get around to doing the Sorrows Fathom, but I definitely want to figure this situation out and then we can obviously just go on and progress the story. It might take me a hot second to remember how everything works because it has been a while or I don't know like a week or so since I played. The reflection before you resembles Aretas but an unmistakably older one. No golden glow surrounds him. He is plain weathered. His hair is streaked with grey and white. His mind is blank to you, dark, his eyes are wild with the weight of his thoughts, but you can't hear any of them. What are you doing in my head? You found my herding stick, he murmurs staring at the ground. I put it down before I opened the black box and the demons came out. They filled every part of the alcove and they filled me up. He takes a deep shuddering breath. Most of them are inside me now, shouting and watching. You found the ones that were left, and they brought me here. Tears feel the wrinkles at the corner of his eyes. How can I help you? He does not appear to have heard you. I need help, he repeats softly. I'm lost. I lived in a grey field with my yole. I named them and pet them and clipped their yellow wool. A tear spills down his nose and drops to the ground. I think they're all dead now. No one fed them but me. He looks around, possibly for an exit. A dark red light raises in his pale eyes. That was a long time ago, before the demons came out of the black box and filled me. Before I was called to the adventure! The louder words tear themselves out of him and he recoils from them, covering his ears. The glow ebbs from his eyes as suddenly as it came. That's one of the voices I've been hearing in the other Aretas' mind, isn't it? He nods, still clutching his ears. They're the loud ones, the brave ones who make me brave. The other ones whisper, they watch, they're hungry. Indigo flickers at the center of his pupils, like a distant bonfire. They want me to die. Aretas' mouth doesn't move, but the words seem to come from him anyway, hissing from the depths of his throat. You want to be free from them, don't you? No, my life will be boring, useless, without them! Aretas staggers back another step, pressing his lips together. The red and indigo flames coiling in his pupil subsides until only the pale blue remains. Yes, please, I want to go home. I want to find my yole and go home. Making a note. Drive them out of me, he says softly. Please, I don't want to be me anymore. I want to be him again. You mentioned a yole before. What's that? Herd creatures. He says, a look of calm happiness drifts beneath his troubled face. Soft yellow wool, milk and cheese. Something like grief descends through his expression, devouring his brief happiness. My herd is lost now. I think they're gone. Sounds like you liked being a yole herder. Not until I wasn't one anymore, he says, dropping his head. I lived in the nameless field where my mother was buried. I liked making songs in my head, but I hated that field. That leaky house. He presses his fingers against his hollow cheeks. I wanted to leave it all behind, to sing for people, for meals in distant taverns. But now I wish I could go back there, sing to my animals, and sleep where my mother slept. Do you have any idea what kind of demons are inside you? I don't, 
he says, shaking. But I feel them, hear them. He licks cracked lips. They glow and keep me awake. They shout and whisper. They live in my veins and cling to my spine with tiny teeth. How did you end up with the demons inside you? One of my yol wandered into the dead valley, he says casually, but his hand is clenched at his side. Its tracks went around the alcove and I decided to sleep there for the night. His fist is shivering. I heard sounds inside a dark box on the shelf and I opened it. And ever since I've been buried by them, by the other me, screaming and crying, never sleeping. He rubs his eyes with dirty knuckles like a child. I never found my yol, and now I never will. They don't let me sleep, and I'm hungry all the time. They don't think of me as real. I'm their toy. How can I help you drive out those demons? I don't know, he says eyes wide, and you see a mocking flicker of light at their cores. Find healers, maybe? Or doctors? Why can't I hear your thoughts? I don't know. I don't know. I think they're holding them, living in them. He chews his lip until it's raw and bleeding, infesting them. Farewell. Okay, so we need to find, like, a healer or something. What's this mess? This is... The clock, t the clock fathom. Haven't we done all the stuff with the clock? Hold on, let's have a look. But before we do that, let's just yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'm there's going. nothing here. I don't know. Oh, right, I can't interact with the map. All right. All right, take two of this thing. So I'm fairly confident we just need to paralyze the sorrow things. I'm going. Now that I have somewhat of an idea, maybe maybe take two will be more uh, productive. Ready to test this out. Okay, so I don't know if the ones that were paralyzed are still paralyzed. Yeah, so that one's paralyzed. That one's paralyzed. So essentially, if we can get these two to come to a location... If you want a job done right. And I think it takes two turns to paralyze them. So I guess yes. let's just get everyone over here. I don't know, maybe I should have got everyone down here. Because I am fairly confident they'll go for Makina. Oh, or not. Hello. Oh, and another one. Hello. Okay, so... Uh, okay, here we are. Uh, let's do this. And everyone should move out of range, which I don't think I can do. I think my dude here is surrounded. Okay, I'm sorry, buddy. Ready. Yeah. 
Oh no! <laughs> yeah, I know, sorry. Saws everyone. Okay, that was that was all I needed to do. <laughs> all right, with the last of the sorrow fragments neutralized, you feel a cool breeze flow through you, mind and body. Your muscles tense with dexterity and strength you haven't felt before, and your mind flows gracefully from thought to thought, exploring possibilities and sensations more quickly than ever before. Gradually, you become aware of a shadow in your mind. The sorrow still has one stronghold somewhere in the labyrinth. You've almost driven it out entirely, but not yet. So, am I... Fine. Hold on. If I have a look at things? Alright, allow the memory to come. You enter the tavern and every face turns to you. The warm susurrus of conversation trails off. They know you and they know what you've come here for. The aldea of Thal supports the nearby clave and the locals keep a cherry eye on the Aeon priests. They know the dangers of the Numenera, the scientists unearthed, and, given their proximity to the endless battle, they know what your tattoo means. You hear the sharp whisper, Cast off scum. You don't give them the satisfaction of looking. But you can feel the tension in the room as you make your way up to the bar. The tavern keeper won't meet your eye. You know what comes next. You sigh and turn to face the room. A large burly woman stands in front of you. You're not welcome here, cast off. Your damn war is a bane. We'll have no cast offs here, not anymore. Get out, or by the gods will make you wish you had. You feel energies building and swelling within you. Your smile is savage as you weave a net of the tides. You have no idea who you're talking to. I am no cast-off. I am their creator. I am the author of the endless battle. I am the changing god, and you will revere me. You hold your hands wide, and the tides spill from you. Half the villagers fall to their knees, weeping as your will twists their hatred into adoration. The burly woman yanks a knife from her belt. You'll not take my mind, monster. Her neighbors fall on her before she can take another step, knives flashing. Her life spills across the floor, around your feet. You step through it, trailing bloody footprints to the door, and you're not sure if the disgust you feel is for the dead woman or for yourself. Okay, I think this video will be purely looking at memories. <laughs> Alright, allow it to come. You have been walking under the wasted sun for what feels like days. The sun does not move on the horizon, and its incessant heat has scoured the plane of life. Your water is running low, and you are seriously considering abandoning this body. And then you see shapes shimmering on the horizon. You release an eye catcher. It will tell you if this is a mirage or a destination. It shoots into the sky, vanishing from sight. It returns with good news. You've discovered an oasis of sorts. You trudge onward, bitterly wishing for better boots. When at last you reach the rude collection of wattle and daub huts, primitive humans gathering around you, beseeching you with a strange tongue, they offer you some of their precious remaining water and you settle down to learn the basics of their language. After a day you know enough to understand the depths of their plight. They say the lurker in the cave has stolen the sun's momentum. They beg you for your aid. After a fitful nap you begin the perilous climb to the cave. Inside a long forgotten installation houses a trapped construct. It speaks through the scree of the fallen ceiling and it tells you that it has demanded that Autochthons clear the rubble.
When they refused to dig it free so that it could return to its work, it sealed the plane inside a time bubble. They will come to reason, it concludes. The construct's needs are paltry compared to the need for water. You concentrate, marshalling your powers, the tides you have been researching. You imagine them as a blade and you hurl them against the construct's circuitry. The machine struggles, throwing up defences against you, but it is no match for this new energy. It fizzles and die, and you feel a wretch as time lurches back into motion. You look at your hands, the flesh hangs loose on your suddenly skeletal frame, a steep price to pay to protect these villagers. So I wasn't all bad. You're watching a display cast through crystal prisms. The images and the colours are a jagged rainbow, just as they have been in every previous iteration of this machine, when they should be a single glowing picture, at least if this device is to function as intended. You hiss through your teeth in frustration. How many years must you waste in trying to align these energies? Is this effort fruitless? Turn it off, you snarl, your apprentice pays you no heed. A moment longer, he murmurs. Just a moment, he is kneeling before the control panel, and he reaches in to make a slight adjustment. Above him, the images and the colours align. He sits back on his haunches, an enormous grin wreathing his face. I knew it, he laughs. I could hear it whispering to me. It's like, like it wants to be done. This is my masterpiece, now what's the next step? You're not sure if your cast-off prodigy is talking to you or the machine. You stare at the back of his head, he's undeniably gifted. In certain aspects, you have to admit, he even surpasses you. This is, after all, part of why you constructed his body the way you did. But now that he's achieved this, do you dare let him return to the world? He knows your deeper secrets now, and holds your future in his hands. But you feel a certain affection for him. To kill him would be poor thanks indeed. Instead you speak. Mazov, you whisper. He turns around, and the instant he makes eye contact, the full force of your psychic power crashes through his meager defences. You insinuate yourself into his memories and erase the details of this last year of work. It's a cruel tool, a bludgeon, but you tell yourself that it's kinder than destroying him. You almost believe it. Oh, interesting. Maybe. Yes. Okay, so I've got two more. You're lost in the scent of her hair, the taste of her mouth, the feel of her skin. You stumble against the door and fumble with the lock, unwilling to break contact with this remarkable, beautiful, wonderful woman. Even before you manage to wrestle the door open, you're already shrugging out of your clothes. Once inside, the rest of your clothes disappear as if by magic. The city outside is noisy, but you can't hear the din of the market as you focus on her breath, her eyes, her body, and the day vanishes like your clothes. Eventually, hours later, night falls and the two of you collapse into the ruined bed. She drifts off to sleep, whispering in your ear of what you could accomplish together. As her contented breath warms your chest, you reflect. You never expected Salamary to be like this when you sought her out. You intended only to take advantage of her position and her expertise, but she has become so much more in such a short time. She, she makes you reconsider everything you've been striving toward all these years. God, you don't even remember feeling love like this for anyone since... No, no. Another memory swells and it reminds you of your goal. What you want in this moment can't distract you from the centuries you have spent building this life. You stroke Salamary's hair and the tides trickle from you into her dreams. You break her love for you, turning it back to the work you've discussed. You refocus her mind and rebuild her affection. You don't want to lose this, but you can't cast off your ambition. You lie in bed waiting for her to wake, for the work to start again. A single tear wells in your eye, you dash it away. 
All right, so we're getting a little bit of backstory right. between all these people that we've met thus far, or some of them anyway. The cheering a throng that spreads before you across Government Square has a voice like thunder rolling and booming through the city. The people in it are victims, survivors, victors, and the last of their enemies kneels before you on the broad steps. You hold your hands aloft for silence. The thunder subsides to a low murmur and becomes a quiet, hungry wait. They want to see vengeance, and so do you. Oh, the ache is so strong. Ojesti Telkotu, you proclaim, orphan maker, hope smasher. The crowd seethes at his titles. Today is the day of your judgment, you roar. Today is the day the Tabat pay in full for the crimes against our citizens, against humanity everywhere. Today sees an end, at last, to the Tabat. The crowd erupts in frenzied joy. You lean forward and whisper in his ears. You have two choices. A quick death or an immortality for which you sacrifice your ambition and your freedom. The tabot stares at you, his strange eyes wide. Why? Because one choice will end your subjugation, here, now, cleanly. The other will give you immortality, but by imprisoning you in time. But consider... One day I might die, and on that day, you'll still be here. I am giving you a gift if you can master it, a victory, but only if you can learn the deadly art of patience. The tabot scowls, sensing some trick. You touch him with your mind to shove him over the edge of desire. He winces as the ripple of your psyche washes over him. He rumbles, death holds no fear but I will tell the future how I bested you. You smile as you turn away, signaling for the machines that will enslave him to your will. Then you pause. He was a notable foe. Perhaps he deserves better than to be a permanent marker for your triumph. You owed him the right to make his own choices, you think. Then you remember the faces of the sickened and dying. You inject him yourself. Okay, I think that is all. We are good in the hood. Yes. You did it. This whole place feels, I don't know, brighter now. But don't get cocky. The sorrow can still kill you well and good in the real world. Find Mazo before that happens. Okay, farewell. Uh, okay, so it did say somewhere else, but maybe we won't see that just yet. I'm ready. Oh, hi, Um. I feel bad that you're just chinchilling in my mind. Lady Anch tells me you touched the Fatori. I'd laugh if I hadn't done the same thing myself. Does he have a name? Oh, he does. Alright, he might have some interesting things to say. Okay, so we've got to speak to Adiris. There's a lot of people with names. 